Moses, a man of selfless dedication, a book written by Chuck Swindoll. Today we're talking about the night nobody slept. Now, last week I uh, encouraged you to go look at this YouTube called Christ in the Passover. Uh, Jews for Jesus put together a presentation showing how all the different details of the uh, Passover meal all point to Jesus Christ. The night that nobody slept. The Israelis didn't sleep. The, the Egyptians didn't sleep. But not, not that God ever sleeps, but God didn't sleep that night either. It was a night of watching by the Lord. There's a picture of the sacrificial lamb, and you know they painted the doorposts and the lintel, and that was a picture of the sacrificial lamb between the two crosses. It is the Lord's Supper. This is where we ended up. We talked about, I will pass through the Lord and through the land. I am the Lord. And you shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised you, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? Kids ask the best questions. How about, why do we pray before we eat? They don't eat, they, they just dig in over at Joey's house. Why do we go to church every week? Why do we eat that little piece of bread and drink from that tiny cup of grape juice? How did he know he was supposed to be a missionary? How did God call him? I'm sure you're all familiar with that face. And that quote came from his inauguration as governor of California many, many years ago. Freedom is a fragile thing and is never more than one generation, one generation away from extinction. Freedom, of course, is, you can might as well say the church is a fragile thing. It is never more than one generation away from extinction. You know, God has no grandchildren. He continues on and he says, it is not ours by inheritance. God has no grandchildren. It must be fought for. Now, you don't earn your salvation. But we need to protect the word of God so that there can be a salvation message. He went on in that same speech and he quoted from the Baron Montague all the way back to 1748. And he says, the deterioration of a government begins almost always by the decay of its principles. You could just as soon apply that to the church, the, de the deterioration of a church begins almost always by the, by the decay of its principles. So here's a quote from Dr. John Sentimu, 2013, an archbishop in the Anglican Church. And if you follow the Anglican Church and the news of the past 10 years, or any major denomination in the past 10 years, there's a lot of deterioration going along. And he says, compared with evangelism, Everything else is like rearranging furniture when the house is on fire. So when the Passover rite was given to the people, God said to Moses, make sure you do this not just generation after generation, but tell your kids because more is caught than taught. And you shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel and Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. That's the exact same thing they did when Aaron and Moses first came back from Midian and they delivered the message, you're going to be set free. They bowed their heads and worshipped. Now, today we're going to concentrate on the crossing of the Red Sea. There'll be no belly aching during that passage. But Moses better be prepared because the next 40 years, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of pushback. The Passover lamb versus Jesus. So first four days, the Passover lamb had to be chosen and brought into the house for four days before the Passover. Imagine that lamb comes into the household and the kids play with it and can, can it sleep with me and this and that and the other. But four days before Jesus died, 
he came in on a donkey. And if you study those four days between Palm Sunday and his crucifixion, you will find that passage after passage, he's proving that he's without blemish. The lamb had to be without blemish, Exodus 12, 5. And we read from 1 Peter, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. One year old. Now, the lamb had to be one year old, and they didn't think about crucifying Jesus when he was one year old. But Jesus was at his prime, about 33 years old when he was crucified. Everyone, every house and each family had to have their own lamb. Everyone has to open their heart for what Jesus has done for them and personally accept him as Lord and Savior. And you see the passage there in Exodus chapter 12. Broken bones. The lamb was supposed to be consumed and not one bone of it was to be broken. You see that in Exodus 12, verse 46. It shall be eaten in one house and you shall not take any of the flesh outside the house and you shall not break any of its bones. Now we read from John's gospel. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. What happened was the chief priests went to Pontius Pilate and they said, you know, we're coming up on Passover and we want to get this thing over with. So Pilate sends out a contingent up to the hill and they take mallets and they break the legs of the other two because to stay alive, what you had to do was pull yourself up, take a gasp of air and drop back down again. And with the broken legs, they couldn't pull themselves up. They suffocated and died. But Jesus was already dead. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And he who saw it was born witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he, what he's saying is the truth. And for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. No leftovers. The lamb had to be consumed entirely. Jesus was consumed entirely. That's how the blood and the water came out. He shed every drop of blood. And we read on uh, John's gospel again, since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, he was totally consumed and put away. Firstborn, the lamb died in place of the firstborn of the Israelites. And on Wednesdays, we're studying the Gospel of Luke. And last week, we covered the purification, where Mary and Joseph took 40-day-old baby Jesus to the temple, and they bought him back. When the Passover angel, which was the Lord, when the Lord passed over and spared all those firstborn, he's saying, they're mine. And so when you have a firstborn, you need to buy him back. And so we read from Romans, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many believers. And ultimately, we come to the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And we read from Romans, but God commends or shows or proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we save by him from the wrath of God. And finally, freedom. The Lamb opened the way for those people to be freed from 400 years of slavery. And we read in Colossians, he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transformed us, or transferred us to the kingdom of his dearly beloved, in whom we have redemption. And we read in Romans, the law of the spirit of life has set you free. Jesus said, if the son of man shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. So faith drives obedience. Israel made history. Pharaoh became history. 
At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Anybody who knows who know who that is? That's Bo Schembechler. What? Who was he? Football coach of the University of Michigan. He said, nothing good ever happens after midnight. Now, his record at that school was 194 and 48. So he must be doing something right. And so when he said nothing good ever happens after midnight, I hope those football players took it to heart. Exodus 12 again. At midnight, the Lord struck down the firstborn, verse 30, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Now, most of you know my dad was a funeral director. And back in the day when I was his helper, most people died at home and not in the hospital. And so by the time we showed up with the hearse, the lights were on, the people were weeping and wailing, the neighborhood, the whole thing. It was a horrible experience, and I was an observer. Imagine that going on in every house. So there was a great cry in Egypt. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Not in Egypt, not away from Egypt, not without your kids, not without your beasts. Just go, just like you said. No compromise. Get out of here. Take your flocks and herds, as you have said, and be gone. And bless me also. Now, Psalm 103 is my favorite psalm. And lost people can be blessed. I know wealthy lost people. I know healthy lost people. But the Bible tells us that if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul, you profits nothing. And so Psalm 103 goes like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And the first one was he has forgiven me my iniquity. Regardless of wealth and health, the only longstanding blessing is salvation and Moses can't do it for Pharaoh. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. The wages of sin is death. Psalm 105, then he brought Israel with silver and gold, and there was none among his tribe who stumbled. Now, <clears throat> every one of us, as I look across the audience, can walk. And if you trip or something, you would call that a stumble. But the proper uh, definition, the proper translation was, there was nobody that was feeble. Imagine two million people, very young, very old, and they're all fit. Nobody was feeble. Egypt was glad when they departed. They'll change their minds in a little bit. But Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. And so the people were brought out with joy. The first song that's mentioned in this Bible is chapter 15, the song of Moses, the horse and rider he threw into the sea. But somehow these people had a song to sing before that happened. So what about us? These things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. It's a great story, makes for a great Sunday school agenda, but there's some, there are takeaways there for us. They're there as our example. We bow our heads and we example, and, and we bow our heads and worship, and we bellyache. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through encouragement of the, of the scriptures, we might have hope. I double back and say, and endurance. Another 40 years, Moses got to lead these people, and he definitely needed endurance to put up with those, the Bible calls them stiff-necked people. 
So the Exodus. <clears throat> so the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. So imagine this bowl inside their jacket. They don't have zippers like the Amish, but inside their jacket, the original backpack. And the people of Israel <clears throat> had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. The Egyptians had dread. The Egyptians were glad to see them go. They gave them whatever they asked them for. And thus they planned, plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. And so that's how you come up with the math to say there's about 2 million people. 600,000 between the ages of 20 and 50, uh, a good number of them were married, a good number of them had kids. There were others that were younger, there were others that were older, and 2 million people, plus the beasts. So what do, what does... Two million people look like. So there's a, a some artist's rendition, but let's let's dig a little deeper. Philadelphia has 1.5 million people, and it covers a, 135 square miles. No beasts, no livestock. I think got cats and dogs, but no livestock. All right. Lancaster County is almost a thousand square miles. It has far less than 2 million people, but lots of beasts. So if you say somewhere between 130 and 1,000 square miles was the real estate that this crew covered, that's a lot of land. That's quite a pathway they had to make through the Red Sea. Either they took a long time crossing or there was a great big wide swath. Either way, what a marvel. A mixed multitude also went with them. Some of the Egyptians, by faith, painted their doorposts and their lentils. And the mixed multitude also, on top of the two million, with all kinds of livestock. And they baked unleavened bread that was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait. And we've covered that verse before, 400, that was mentioned to Abraham, verses 430. And it was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt, so that this same night is a night of watching kept by the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. And so we're covering the chapter called, The Night Nobody Slept. We're jumping into chapter 12. Between the devil and the deep red sea. Now, what phrase do you use when you're under pressure? Some folks would say, I'm in a jam. I'm in a pickle. I'm in a catch-22. I once had some people that grew up in Europe work for me, and I use these colloquialisms. They look at me like, one will say, boss, boss, what do you mean? In a crucible? Malachi chapter 3 talks about the refiner's fire, fire. In the coffee pot, James Dobson talked about going whitewater rafting or kayaking or whatever he was in. And there was one spot where there was a, a whirlpool called the coffee pot. And he got caught in that coffee pot and he was afraid for his life. Between a rock and a hard spot, between the devil and the deep blue sea is the phrase some folks use. Well, we've changed that now. We call it between the devil and the deep red sea. Thomas Paine, during the Revolutionary War era, these are times that try men's souls. Imagine you're walking out of Egypt, never been anywhere else other than the work site. You've got a pillar of cloud or fire before you, and the people behind you saying, get out of here. These are times that try men's souls. And we're going to find they're now leaving Ramses, but they're soon going to be butt up against the Red Sea. There's the rest of that quote. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier, compare that with Valley Forge, those guys almost froze to death. 
the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now, the time when that battle was hot and heavy, deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. So that's exactly where they were between the devil and the deep Red Sea, and God put them there. Sometimes God puts us between a rock and a hard spot, and you have to scratch your head and say, well, why would he do that to me? Why? And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. There's a passage in John's gospel. It's the sickness and the death of Lazarus. And Jesus says, this illness does not lead to death. Well, he died, but that was a physical death. This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Why do we go through pain and anguish? Why do good things happen to bad people? I heard A.W. Tozer, I read A.W. Tozer say, well, that only happened one time, and he didn't deserve it. But why do bad things happen to good people? You read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and there's seven reasons. And there's one of it, that when we come out of it, we can give God the glory. The real champion is the one who gives God the glory in the middle of the hot seat. Pillars of cloud and fire. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So there you see a map. And if you can see the little red line, that's the trade route from, the, from Egypt up into Israel. Goes up above the Red Sea. It's 110 miles, 11 days journey. It only took the Hebrews 40 years. But God led the people around. And if you see the little red line, you can see the, the different directions that they went. Now, keep in mind, these locations, nobody's quite sure exactly where they were. And people will argue one way or the other as to just exactly what it is. And on that map, you can see that little dimple of land where they, they supposedly crossed over. Well, we don't know if the over the ages erosion changed the landscape or whatever, but we do know that they were up against the sea. They were entrapped. And they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness, and they followed God to a dead end. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, to lead them along the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. Now you see this verse and somebody asked me this question recently, it may have been you know, somebody from within this class and they asked about this verse in Proverbs and he will make straight your paths. Well, you know, if you're following that fire or that cloud, you're not really paying much attention you're going to, as far as God is concerned, that path is straight. If we look back at our footprints, it might be kind of crooked, but he will make our paths straight. So there's a blow up of that same map. And God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Now, many of you have heard people argue about the Reed Sea. Well, they have a point, but we're going to debunk the point. That word is the same word that is translated in Jonah as weeds, reeds or weeds. And so there's a point there. It's a, it's an, a sea that is famous for the seaweed that's in it. And so it's the reed sea. However, when they wrote the New Testament, they could have fixed that by calling it the Greek word for reed, but didn't. They called it the Red Sea. And there's the Greek word. Now, Hebrews 11, by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea. 
imagine it'll keep in mind they didn't see the movie they didn't read the book there's the 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 army on the one side and there's the ocean on the other side and all of a sudden the water is split the ground is dry and moses says go by faith those people step down into that valley now they were followed by the egyptians and the title that we're covering right now is Faith Drives Obedience. Now, some of those soldiers, they may have gone down there simply to follow orders. I wouldn't call that obedience. I would call that duress, right? During World War II, the Russians, as they would attack the Germans, they told those soldiers to advance. And if you didn't advance, you got shot. And so you had a choice. You could advance and get probable death, or you can retreat and get definite death. So that's not obedience. But I want to talk to you about sincerity. You can be sincere in what you believe and be dead wrong. The story's told of a husband and wife. They tucked themselves in bed, and the husband kept a loaded revolver you know, for self-defense. And during the night, they hear this noise. And the front door opens, and they can hear the steps across the hardwood floor, and they can hear the steps coming up the staircase, and they can hear the steps coming down the hall towards them. And the husband empties the revolver through the door. The daughter was a grade A student, was exempt from finals, and came home from college a week early. He was sincere but he was dead wrong. She was dead, but he was dead wrong. Sincerity can kill. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. The water became a wall to them on their right and the wall on the left. Now, the, the supposed scholars are trying to help God out by saying, you know, he really didn't mean a wall of water. What he really meant to say was between the seaweed and the tides and this and that, they found a pathway along the beach and they got, they got safe. That word is the same word that the Bible uses to describe the walls of Jericho, the walls of Jerusalem, the walls of Babylon, and it isn't translated anything else anywhere in the Old Testament that's a Hebrew word other than meaning a wall. And there was a wall of water on their right and a wall of water on their left. Now, this is how the scene was described not by the supposed scholars, but by the people who were there. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. Adversaries, You send out your fury, it consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, the floods stood up in a heap, the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. Congeal is what jello does when it goes from hot when you make it to where it wiggles and i can imagine if you've ever been to the national aquarium or epcot center and they've got these glass and behind the glass these sharks and i can imagine going through the red sea just like that a wall of water on the right and the wall of water on the left because the sea had become congealed the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Maybe David was thinking about this when he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I shall fear no evil. So the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Now, that's an interesting picture. And we're going to soon come to the passage where 
They're trapped at the sea. The army is advancing. God tells Moses, tell the people to go forward. And he moves the pillar. I won't say cloud or fire because uh, I want to make a point. He moves the pillar behind them, separating Pharaoh from the Hebrews. Now, when we read that passage, and that's why I stopped right here. When we read that passage at that particular time, it's happening overnight that the wind is blowing and making the pathway for them. It seems like that pillar for the Hebrews is light by night, but that same pillar to the Egyptians was darkness, was blackness. So they're coming over here and all they see is a wall of black. We'll get to that verse and you can think about that on your own. Crossing the Red Sea. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of pi Haroth between Big Dole and the sea, in front of Bel Zephon, and you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. So the question becomes, who trapped whom? And I will harden Pharaoh's heart again, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Now, it's a fi fine thing to know that I am the Lord. The Bible says the, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But we'll see a verse that says, and the Hebrews will see the Egyptians never again forever. So they knew that he was the Lord, but it was too late. <laughs> then the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled and the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed. He changed his mind, but he wouldn't change his heart. His mind was changed toward the people and they said, what is this we have done? We just let go of our workforce of 2 million people, 600,000 able-bodied men that were building our cities, and now they're gone. What have we done? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots. He took his special forces, say the Marines, and he took the army. and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. Well, that was in his mind. They were going out in obedience. In his mind, they were leaving a, a defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army. Josephus, if you believe him, says 200,000 footmen and overtook them and camped at the sea. And when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. Now, they came to the sea, which means the walking is done. They have conversations. They've got the animals going on. I don't know if they saw this cloud of dust coming towards them. I don't know if they heard like the thundering of the horses coming. But behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly king james says sore afraid just like the shepherds not regular afraid but sore afraid and the people cried out to the lord just like peter on the sea of galilee you remember the passage jesus was walking on the water and peter said if you be jesus bid me come and jesus says come on and peter steps out and he's walking on the water but then when he shifts his attention to the winds and the waves, what happens to Peter? Down he goes. And Peter cried out. And I love that verse. The Bible says, and Jesus immediately stretched forth his hand. He didn't say, well, I'm going to let Peter take a dip once in a while so he realized how foolish he was. He immediately stretched forth his hand. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? 
What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? How many told you so's have we had so far in these chapters? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. They went from bowing their heads and worshiping to leave us alone. We'd rather die a, a slow and painful and old age death than die here in the desert. And Moses said to the people, God helps those who help themselves. No, <laughs> God helps the helpless. Some people think that phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. God helps the helpless. What he really said was this, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord. That's what Jonah said when he was inside the belly of the fish. He was going to see the salvation of the Lord. That's what Simeon said when he saw that little baby. He said, now I can depart in peace for I have seen the salvation of the Lord. And nobody can depart in peace unless you've seen the salvation of the Lord. Which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. So God did four mighty deeds just then. First, he told Moses to go forward. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Now, there are several times in the Bible where the Lord said, stop praying. Here's the first one. Stop crying out to me. Tell the people to go forward. The second time was towards the end of Deuteronomy, and Moses says, oh, please, please, please let me go into the promised land. And the Bible said the Lord got angry and said, too bad for you. You had a breach in faith. You're going to die. The third time was Joshua was praying about how he should go into battle, and the Lord said, you know what to do. Just go and do it. And the fourth time is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, when do we stop praying? When we get a specific answer from God that says, stop it. Because otherwise, his answer is, wait a while. So the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Now, that's important because they've been following this pillar. Now he moves the pillar to the back end of them, and he's saying, go away from the pillar. Then the angel of the Lord, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And the third thing he did was he opened a path through the Red Sea. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. Now, whenever you see wind in the Bible, you don't have to look hard to find the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he talked about the wind. When the day of Pentecost came, the Bible says there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. The Holy Spirit was there just like the times of creation. And the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. Before we started, we talked about, well, I was talking about the water table and the ponds coming down. Now, that water has gone down gradually, but I don't even want to walk on the part that used to be wet because it's all slimy and greasy, and I'm going to end up in the pond. But that wind dried up that muck, and they could walk on dry ground. And the fourth thing that he did was he brought confusion to the Egyptians. And in the morning watch, it was still dark. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptians into a panic. And what did God tell the people? All they had to do was be silent. <clears throat> The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea. And Moses is sitting there saying, well, why didn't I think of that? You know, there are two interesting prophets, Moses and Elijah. 
And Elijah didn't have to go to the Lord to be told about the contest between Elijah and the false, false priests. He just did his thing. Is this Moses a little bit not exactly full of faith? We don't know. But God says to him, don't ask me, just do it. Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go over the sea on dry ground. Now, I've been wait, long, waiting a long time to show that cartoon. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, all the Egyptians, not just Pharaoh this time. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night. Back to that one picture I was showing you. Was it darkness? Was it blackness to Pharaoh? But yet it lit up the light for the Egyptians? We don't know. But God was taking care of two different populations, two very different ways. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind. So the Egyptians pursued them. And you see this verse 25, 25 clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. Now that's a bad translation. That word clogging comes from this word sewer. And it means to remove. Those wheels didn't get just clogged up. And I've been stuck in the snow and in the mud many, many times, got the four-wheel drive and do its thing. No, God removed. The, remember the movie Ben-Hur and the chariot race and the, 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 the wheels fell off? The wheels fell off those chariots and they were definitely dragging, driving heavily. And so the soldiers, they got this great idea. Let us flee. Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So now you see some soldiers marching forward, some soldiers running back. The Hebrews get out of the valley, and Moses extends his arm, and down come the waters. Now those Soldiers didn't die just from asphyxiation. They died from pressure. Atmospheres change every 32 feet. And I don't know how deep the Red Sea was, but it was down there. They were crushed. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. But the people walked on dry ground. And thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Moses.